The results of the clinical trial by the World Health Organization show that remdesivir, the antiviral drug widely prescribed against COVID-19, doesn't reduce mortality or hospital stay. American pharma major Pfizer may file for authorization of its COVID-19 vaccine in late November, says the filing could come as soon as safety data is available, possibly in the third week of November. India's active COVID-19 cases fall for the 13th day in a row, slipping below 8.1 lakh, but the situation deteriorates in Europe, France, Germany, Italy and the UK report a record surge in cases. Indian equities get back in the green after a day's pause. The Sensex and the Nifty end over half a percent higher as bank stocks find buyers. But Thursday's rout results in a two-week winning streak coming to an end. Benchmark indices end the week over a percent lower. Global equities trade mixed. States welcome the centre's decision to borrow 1.1 lakh crore rupees from the market on behalf of states to cover the GST compensation shortfall. Some states seek same terms for the balance of the gap in the GST compensation. The auto industry body Siam September data shows a 26.5% growth in passenger vehicle sales. Commercial vehicle manufacturers also tell CNBC TV18 they're witnessing a demand uptick as they pin their hopes on the festive season for further growth. The ministerial panel may soon give its nod for a stake sale in a debt-free Air India. Sources add there are some serious doubts as to whether a plain extension to the EOI timelines would elicit any serious interest. That's a CNBC TV 18 exclusive. The Supreme Court appoints a panel headed by Justice Madan Loku to monitor stubble burning in states neighbouring Delhi despite the opposition to his appointment from UP and Haryana. The CJI observes that people in Delhi should be able to breathe clean air. Less than three weeks before the US election day, President Trump and his Democratic rival Joe Biden Headline dueling town halls as he feels an intense line of questioning. Trump refuses to disavow QN on conspiracy theory. Joe Biden focuses on his plans to confront key challenges, including COVID-19. The top story this evening, it was the most popular therapy against COVID-19 so far. And now a study by the World Health Organization claims that remdesivir does not cut mortality or reduce hospital stay of patients. The study is yet to be peer-reviewed and Gilead Sciences, that's the maker of remdesivir, has raised objections on the data. This could have ramifications for several Indian pharma companies like Dr. Reddy, Sipla, among others, who have signed deals with Gilead to produce and supply remdesivir. Archana Shukla joins us now with more. Archana, take us through the WHO study and its ramifications. And it includes not just remdesivir, but other drugs like HCQ. Well, yes, uh, if you remember the HCQ trials and the Lipon uh, uh, liponavir trials were halted and, and stopped uh, in uh, around July and August when uh, uh, WHO realized that the, con the data was not coming out to be as expected and it was not showing any clinical benefits. Uh, so the data right now that WHO has submitted and it's an interim uh, uh, report that they have published uh, uh, suggests that remdesivir and interferon beta, which were the other two therapies that they were also studying to uh, see any effectiveness in COVID-19 treatment, uh, show that they can conclusive evidence and that evidence is disappointing. Uh, this was a trial done on 11,266 COVID-19 patients uh, across 30 countries and it showed that uh, these drugs, particularly remdesivir, because this was the more uh, uh, promising uh, drug, has shown no impact on either reducing mortality or initiation of ventilation or even in reducing hospital stay of COVID-19 uh, patients. Remember, moderate and critical patients are being administered this drug under emergency use authorization across the world, including India. But WHO says that there has been no clinical benefit shown uh, for this drug. Uh, now, this is in line with some of the other published research that has been done uh, that shows that there has been no clinical uh, improvement or any impact of mortality that remdesivir has had on moderate or critical patients. Uh, there was a published uh, study in Lancet uh, that indicated uh, uh, that there has been no mortality impact. But Gilead Sciences, who's also been conducting trials on its own, has uh, questioned the data and said 
uh, that the trial design of WHO is uh, questionable and it is not conclusive, it is not consistent with other reports because Gilead trials have shown that it, uh, imp it, it reduces hospital stay by five days. Uh, the impact on India would be huge. There are six drug makers. The market in India is 120 crore rupees. And there are multiple uh, other countries that these companies are supplying remdesivir to. We are seeing there is, an over uh, there is a shortage and overcharging of these drugs because the drug is not available and doctors are actually using it because they are saying that yeah. in hospital, if they are... Uh, if this drug is given to patients who are not on oxygen and are moderately ill, they have actually seen some benefit. So there is uh, a disparity and dispute uh, between the research data that has been published. Yes. Back to you. Yes, uh, that is a WHO study. Archana, many thanks for joining us. And speaking of remdesivir, the Maharashtra government's decision to cap the price of the drug takes effect from today. The decision was taken a couple of days ago to impose 2,360 rupees ceiling on a 100 milligram vial of remdesivir. Now, American pharma giant Pfizer may file for authorization of its COVID-19 vaccine in late November. The company has said the regulatory filing for the vaccine could come as soon as safety data is available, possibly in the third week of November. Pfizer is developing the vaccine with its German partner, BioNTech. Its timeline now allows for a possible U.S. authorization of a COVID vaccine this year. This is an open letter put out by the Pfizer CEO. And speaking of vaccines, the Serum Institute is looking to increase the scope of its vaccine trial in India. It now wants to include all the individuals, people with health conditions and those at high risk of infection and those who have also recovered from the COVID-19 infection. The vaccine maker believes the new inclusion criteria will test the vaccine on high-risk individuals and is close to the real-world scenario. This will also align it with the ongoing global trials by Oxford and AstraZeneca. So that's the latest on serum. A quick check of the daily COVID numbers. Active cases have seen a decline for 13 days in a row, now closer to the 8 lakh mark. Active cases have dropped by nearly 1.5 lakh in the last two weeks. More than 63,000 new infections, though, were reported and over 70,000 people have recovered in the last 24 hours. The death toll is now at over 1.1 lakh with 894 deaths being reported in the last 24 hours. Daily tests were just over 10 lakh. This is less than the 11 to 12 lakh tests that we have seen over the last few days. Testing hit 14 lakh a couple of weeks ago, but it has not got back closer to that number. And Europe is battling a second wave with several countries reporting record daily infections. Many nations have reimposed restrictions on the movement of people in major cities like London, Paris, Barcelona and others. Juliana is here with a wrap. Juliana. Yesterday, we saw European stocks plunge as investors grew concerned around new restrictions being imposed across the region to combat the spread of COVID-19. Now, today, investors are continuing to closely watch the virus numbers and the restrictions set to come into effect. France reported a jump of more than 30,000 new cases ahead of a nighttime curfew being imposed in Paris, as well as eight other major cities in the country. The Spanish region of Catalonia has introduced tough new measures, including the closing of some bars and restaurants. And here in the United Kingdom, several changes are coming into effect today across England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. This includes new restrictions in London, uh, England's capital, starting at midnight. People from separate households will be banned from mixing indoors. That goes for both household mixing and mixing at pubs and restaurants. So a lot of attention continues to be focused on COVID-19, the spread of the virus and the new restrictions put in place. Juliana, many thanks. Now, as you may recall, the concerns over the spike in global COVID-19 cases has hurt sentiment on the Lal Street on Thursday, causing indices to drop by over 2%. So today was a day of bargain hunting, and by the end of the day, Sensex and the Nifty were each half a percent higher. Support coming in from bank stocks, which had taken it on the chain on Thursday. That index gained 2% over the course of the session. The mid-cap index also clocked healthy gains. However, Thursday's route has taken a toll on the weekly performance, and today's rebound was not enough to stop a two-week gaining streak from ending the Sensex and the Nifty ending the week lower by over 1% each. Now, after maintaining that states should borrow to bridge the GST compensation shortfall, the centre has finally relented. The finance ministry said the centre would borrow the 1.1 lakh crore rupees on behalf of states and would pass it on to the states as back-to-back -back loans. The centre said the borrowing would not impact the fiscal math as it would be reflected as capital receipts on state government's books. That's not all. The centre has also revised its second-half borrowing calendar to accommodate the special window. States, even those not ruled by the BJP, have now welcomed the centre's move. Some of them have sought the same term 
terms for the balance of the gap in the GST compensation. अगर सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट पहले तैयार हो जाती कि हम बोरो कर लेंगे जो डिसीजन उन्होंने कर लिया फिर शायद इतनी कंट्रोवर्सीज होती ही नहीं सो दो कंट्रोवर्सीज आर ओवर नाउ सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट इज बोरिंग दैट्स ए गुड थिंग डेली इज गोइंग टू सफर ए सेटबैक ऑफ सिक्सटीन थाउजेंड बिकॉज ऑफ इंप्लीमेंटेशन ऑफ जी एस टी दिस ईयर नाउ अंडर दिस ऑप्शन वी आर जस्ट गेटिंग अप्रॉक्सीमेटली फाइव थाउजेंड एट हंड्रेड अप्रॉक्सीमेटली सिक्स थाउजेंड करोड़ रुपीज सो हमें दस हजार करोड़ रुपए कम मिल रहे हैं यही बात चीफ मिनिस्टर साहब ने भी कही है फाइनेंस मिनिस्टर को हमने भी फाइनेंस मिनिस्टर सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट के समक्ष उठाई है काउंसिल डिसीजन इज रिक्वायर फॉर एक्सटेंशन ऑफ द कॉम्पेंसेशन सेस कलेक्शन एस वेल एस डेफरमेंट ऑफ कॉम्पेंसेशन सेस पेमेंट बियॉन्ड फाइव इयर्स दैट इज वेरी क्लियर फ्रॉम एजी स्टेट सो माय प्लीज Since it's not going to be reflected in the central government's fiscal deficit, why don't you borrow this entire amount, 1.7 lakh crores rupees, and make it available to states? So breakthrough on the GST front. A quick check of the other headlines. Auto industry body Siam September data shows a 26.5% growth in passenger vehicle sales. Commercial vehicle manufacturers also tell CNBC TV18 they're witnessing a demand uptick as they pin their hopes on the festive season. Passenger vehicle and the, the motorcycle, the, you know, uh, uh, you know, coming at the festival season, that uh, we have a uh, strong demand. Fortunately, right now industry is uh, focusing at how we are producing a you know, product uh, under COVID condition. As I mentioned, we are focusing that, and uh, maybe uh, we try to achieve that uh, you know, uh, satisfy that the demand request from the, the market. Uh, as I mentioned in my address. Uh, Now that it is a very difficult for estimate to near future after you know December. It is looking up. In fact, uh, in the month of September, we saw an improvement in the TIV close to 30-35 percent. And in October, with the festive season kicking in, we expect further growth in the demand. But what is happening is that the segments within the commercial vehicles are panning out and playing out very differently. We see a lot of demand coming in from the uh, light commercial vehicles and the intermediate commercial vehicles. The commercial vehicle industry now, month on month, it is looking better. And uh, going forward, uh, uh, since the festive season also has started. So we are expecting that uh, the industry should become better. This year, first six months, the industry size is only 50 million. Uh, typically, uh, in commercial vehicles, uh, the replacements happen in four to six years' time, especially in the heavy-duty trucks. Uh, now, those replacements, uh, in fact, have not been happening in last two years. Last year also, they were very, very less, and this year, six months, of course, it has been a, almost a washout. So therefore, we are expecting a very strong replacement demand coming back. So demand expected to return. That's the view of the auto sector. HCL Tech posting an all-round beat in Q2 net profit, dollar revenue, rupee revenue, all ahead of expectations. EBIT margins at a five-year high. US business is up nearly five percent. Europe by 2.2 percent. And in the rest of the world, it's up by nine percent. The company will hike salaries of employees effective from October and will hire 12,000 freshers for FY21. The timeline for the expression of interest for BPCL may not need further extension. On the contrary, sources say the government expects stiff competition to help it get a better price. Government sources tell CNBC TV18 all options are open as far as the IDBI stake sale is concerned. LIC may be keen to divest its stake in the bank, is what we're given to understand. Here's another exclusive. The ministerial panel may soon give its nod for a stake sale in a debt-free Air India. Sources add that there are some serious doubts as to whether a plain extension to the EOI timelines would elicit any serious interest. Sapna Das joins us now with more. Sapna, is the government seriously considering selling Air India without the buyer taking on any debt at all? 
Well, what we are given to understand is that uh, probably as early as next week, the ministerial panel dealing with the strategic stake sale of Air India could meet and uh, maybe a formal nod may just be possible as far as the changed parameters for the Air India stake sale are concerned. This proposal has been doing the rounds for quite some time and there has been detailed discussion uh, within the top government circles uh, on this matter. Having said that, uh, basically what the government um, could propose down the line uh, to potential bidders is the fact that uh, you know they would like the market to discover the enterprise value of Air India, which essentially means that they would not like to uh, freeze Air India's debt at a certain level and then give it to the, and then present it to the bidders in the sense that bidders will have to also include the debt portion. So that may not uh, be a primary condition uh, going forward. Of course, that number is known by everyone around 23 odd thousand crores. So at so once the state sale process is over this 23,000 crores uh, you know will get transferred to the SPV that uh, is already in place uh, to absorb this uh, Air India debt. Uh, basically the government is also of the view that uh, once the change process comes through and as of now this is a discussion stage but going forward once the ministry will not come through because the EOI deadline is also expiring uh, at the end of this month so that formal call may have to be taken quickly. Uh, so, you know, once the process is through, the government will also be engaging with investors, uh, you know, to make them understand how the processes have changed. Of course, this is a long-standing demand that had uh, been coming through uh, from the bidders themselves. Probably the change circumstances post-COVID, uh, you know, has, uh, you know, uh, basically encouraged government uh, to think on these lines. And uh, the problem with Air India could be very clear, is very clear. It is sitting on a general debt of around 85 odd thousand crores. And on top of that, it needs around 6,000 odd crores just to survive. I mean, just for uh, daily operations in a year, it needs 6,000 crores of capital infusion from the government. So that is clearly unsustainable, is the government's view. Uh, going forward, uh, this is the proposal that we should be looking forward. And uh, this is the first time that it would be happening as far as the Air India stake sale is concerned. All right, Sapna, many thanks for joining us. Now, the deadline to submit bids for crisis at Devan Housing Finance Corporation ends tomorrow. Sources tell us banks are bracing for a lukewarm response as not more than four to five players are expected to submit bids. Ritu Singh here with more. Ritu. Well, you know, when lenders invited expressions of interest from suitors for DHFL in February, two dozen suitors had lined up and were talking about marquee names from the private equity and strategic side. But given since then, in the last seven months, the COVID-19 pandemic has struck, uh, you know, which has given cold feet to a lot of people when it comes to making investment decisions. And then more instances of fraud have also emerged at DHFL, which is why a lot of these players have now backed out. And now bankers that we've been speaking to expect only four or five of these 22 shortlisted suitors to come forward. So Pyramal Enterprises and Oak Tree Capital are expected to make bids for the retail assets of uh, DHFL, whereas Adani Properties and SC Lowy are expected to make bids for the wholesale business. And this is because, if you recall, lenders had given options to the suitors to either bid for some of the assets or the entire company. In fact, we're given to understand that Oak Tree may also consider uh, submitting a bid for the entire portfolio as well. The fact that these players have been making inquiries gives lenders does hope uh, that perhaps when the deadline comes to an end tomorrow, uh, they will submit their bids. But will they put their money where their mouth is? We'll only find out at the end of the deadline. All right, many thanks, Ritu. Up next, the Supreme Court appoints a panel headed by Justice Madan Loku to monitor stubble burning in states neighboring Delhi. That and more when we return. As air quality in Delhi and its surrounding areas continues to worsen, the Supreme Court has constituted a panel headed by former SC Judge Justice Madan Loku to monitor stubble burning. Now, the Apex Court made the appointment despite the opposition from states like UP and Haryana. During the course of today's hearing, the Chief Justice observed that people in Delhi and CR should be able to breathe clean air. Ashmit joins us now with more. Ashmit, take us through the proceedings in court, not without a fair degree of drama. Uh, indeed, well, in fact, it's uh, again that time of the year when clean air becomes a luxury, not just in Delhi NCR, but in, in fact, the Indo Gangetic Plate suffers from poor air quality uh, this time of the year. And taking note of the issue, uh, the Supreme Court, a bench headed by none other than the Chief Justice himself, uh, has appointed a panel. And now this panel will be headed uh, by retired Supreme Court Judge Justice Madan B. Loker. Now, uh, just to give uh, a brief idea for the benefit of our viewers, uh, Justice Madan B. Loker dealt extensively with pollution matters. In fact, it was under his watch that the current uh, graded response action plan that we currently hear of was in fact formalized under his watch when he was hearing the matter 
in the Supreme Court. So he's very familiar with the matter. He's in tune with the various stakeholders. He's in tune with uh, the various policy makers and the difficulties faced. And he has been, has been picked as the ideal person uh, to look after, to look at this commission. Now, what is the mandate of this committee? Well, the mandate of the committee is to, in fact, monitor the issue of stubble burning. That has been one of the major contributors uh, to poor air quality in the Northern Belt. And that is something that they will be monitoring. Uh, the committee has been given the mandate of coming out with periodic reports. In fact, the first assessment will have to come out before the next date of hearing, which is uh, October 26th. Uh, and uh, there has been a very clear direction issued to the chief secretaries of all the three neighboring states of Delhi and Sia, that's Haryana, Punjab, as well as UP, to lend any assistance required uh, by that one-man commission. Uh, but let's also not forget that the Solicitor General appearing for the states of Haryana and UP were not terribly excited at the mention of Justice Madan B. Loker. In fact, uh, they had also registered their opposition to uh, Madan B. Loker, Justice Madan B. Loker heading this committee, uh, but the Chief Justice, Justice Bobbley, would not have any of it and has dismissed those opposition right. coming in from the state of Haryana and UP. And this matter once again on October 26th. All right, Ashmit, appreciate you joining us. So that is uh, the latest in the war against air pollution. But the big global story, less than three weeks for the U.S. election day, President Trump and his Democratic rival Biden headlined dueling town halls. The simultaneous and separate televised town halls were held after the cancellation of the second presidential debate scheduled for Thursday night. President Trump, who fielded an intense line of questioning, refused to disavow the QA on conspiracy theory. Joe Biden focused on his plans to confront key challenges, including COVID. 19. Tracy Potts has more. Our polls show that some people have yet to make up their minds between these two very different candidates and different tone in Philadelphia with Biden last night. More calm tone up there. The president down in Miami, sometimes hostile to the questions he was being asked. Well stated, I have to say. Good job. President Trump and Democratic nominee Joe Biden both making news in their competing town halls. The president with NBC Savannah Guthrie on losing the election. Will you accept a peaceful transfer? And the answer is yes, I will. But I want it to be an honest election. Vice President Biden on ABC with George Stephanopoulos on enlarging the U.S. Supreme Court. So you'll come out with a clear position before Election Day? Yes depending on how they handle this. Both candidates answered questions on coronavirus, Biden slamming the president's response. It is a presidential responsibility to lead, and he didn't do that. The president on testing at the last debate. You don't know if you took a test the day of the debate. Uh, uh, possibly I did, possibly I didn't. President Trump tried to clear up concerns about race. Are you listening? I denounce white supremacy. And the $400 million he reportedly owes. No, I don't owe Russia money. I don't owe, I owe a very, very small, it's called mortgages. Yeah. People have a house, they any put a mortgage. Any foreign bank, any foreign entity? Not that I know of. Biden addressed criticism about the 90s crime bill, the Green New Deal, and whether he'd mandate a coronavirus vaccine. It depends on the state of the nature of the vaccine, when it comes out, and how it's being distributed. Both men are set to appear on the same stage next week for the final debate in Nashville. But for today, it's back to the campaign trail down south for the president in Georgia and Florida, back to Florida, a state where he's trailing Biden. And Biden is going back to Michigan, a state that Democrats desperately want to win back this time around. He's talking health care up there today. Tracy Potts, many thanks. You can catch our 360-degree coverage of the U.S. elections on Global Eye. That's coming up at 9.30 p.m. with my colleague Parikshit Lutra. He'll be joined by Micah Roberts, Republican pollster, and someone who's been managing polls for CNBC since 2010. Milan Veshnav, senior fellow and director, South Asia Project at Carnegie Endowment. Shivinder Singh, the vice president of the Global Trade Department at NASCOM. And Richard Rosso, senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. A packed show lined up for you coming up. With that, it is time for us to wrap up this edition of India Business Hour. Thanks very much for watching.